Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm David Martin, board chair of the Woodward Hines Education Foundation. Before we get started to honor the foundation's 25th anniversary, I'd like to acknowledge the many friends and colleagues who have joined us here today virtually. They include current and former board members of, Wood of Woodward Hines, current and former staff members, former executive directors, representatives from Millsaps College, and many individuals I won't name who have a long history with both organizations. So when we began planning our 25th anniversary in 2019, I can tell you that a virtual event was the furthest thing from our minds. The term virtual event was, was not even in my vocabulary. Yet, when you look at the incredible work that Woodward Hines has done this year, it almost seems fitting that we celebrate this way. Let me explain that. In a typical year, our Get to College counselors would meet with Mississippi High School students in person. The counselors would help the students fill out their FAFSA forms and the materials they need to apply for college and financial aid. But in 2020, that has not been typical. Instead of face-to-face, -face, we've used virtual counseling to meet students online or by phone if they don't have internet. We've mailed out information and posted it on YouTube. We've set up tables in school parking lots with port portable printers and Wi-Fi. Whatever it took to get the job done. And I know that Jack Woodward, who always said, we'll find a way, would be immensely proud of that effort. So as much as anything, it's that can-do spirit and resilience that we honor with this celebration. Because when we, when we look at the history of Woodward Hines Education Foundation, we see several crises that could have put a lesser organization out of business. There have been recessions, new regulations, market declines, and now a pandemic that at the time all seemed insurmountable. Yet we have surmounted them and for I think at least two good reasons. First, I believe that in 1980, when the Mississippi Higher Education Assistance Corporation was formed to provide education finance to students in Mississippi, that mission was just too important to fail. MEAC, as we call it, is the current nonprofit parent of Woodward Hines Education Foundation. Well, v Victor Hugo once said, there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come that was never truer in Mississippi where financial barriers made college an impossible dream for thousands of promising young people. By the early 1980s, the social and economic well-being of our state depended upon addressing that education inequity. And MEAC helped significantly by creating a successful nonprofit program to fund federally guaranteed student loans. For the full MEAC story, you'll have to read Defying Odds, Fulfilling Dreams. This is a fascinating new history of Woodward Hines Education Foundation written by Millsaps graduate, Polly DeMint. You might not think that a book about student loan financing would be a page turner, but Polly's managed to accomplish that. Other guests will tell us more about the book later. A second reason the Woodward Hines Education Foundation has survived and thrived is also told with rich detail in Polly's book. But the short answer is Jack Woodward and Herman Hines. It was a great privilege for me to know and work with both of these men. As I soon learned in terms of their impact, you could say that one plus one equaled three when they got together. They complemented each other in, in ways that far surpassed what each could have done individually. Jack had the vision as director of financial aid at Millsaps, he made a college degree possible for hundreds, maybe thousands of cash-strapped first-generation students. Myself was one of them. He often, often did this with money from his own pocket. Jack was trained as a minister, but instead of a pulpit, he made the college campus his mission field. As for Herman Hines, he was an institution builder. He knew business, he knew bond markets, he knew finance. Herman also had a big heart and he knew how to build a foundation beneath Jack's dream. That foundation has grown and endured because Herman built things to last. 
His good work has stood the test of time, and it's why we're all here today. While Woodward Hines Education Foundation's first 25 years have been remarkable, we believe it's only the beginning. Thanks to our founders and today's staff and leaders, we're on course to change young lives and communities in Mississippi for years and decades to come. And the spirit of looking forward, I'd like to introduce Jim McHale, who is the president and CEO of the Woodward Hines Education Foundation. Jim came to Woodward Hines in 2015 after serving for 21 years at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation as Senior Vice President for Programs. As Polly writes in her book, Jim's gentle, low-key manner has made him a natural for adapting to Southern culture. Jim also has an affinity for young people and communities and a keen eye for program strategy and organization design. In other words, he knows how to squeeze the most benefit out of every grant dollar that we award to the good people of Mississippi. With that, let me turn things over to Jim McKay. Thank you, David, for that very generous introduction. And thanks to everyone for joining us as we celebrate the Woodward Hines Education Foundation's 25th anniversary. Over the past year, we have reflected on the Foundation's history, and I've had the opportunity to reflect on my first five years at the Foundation. And during that time, we have adopted a new mission and vision statement, expanding our focus from getting more students to college, but also helping them get them through college. And we've also developed a set of core values that guide our work. We have transitioned from being primarily a direct service provider, but have also become a grant maker, a trainer, an advocate, and a convener. To date, our assets are approximately $163 million, making us one of the largest grant making foundations based in Mississippi. Over the last few years, we've made grants across the state totaling just over $6 million. This is over and above the approximately $2 million we spend annually on our Get to College services. Over the past four years, our Get to College program has transitioned from what I would describe as a retail model to more of a wholesale model. While we used to focus on providing individual direct services for as many students as we could squeeze into a day, our work has grown and emerged to include college access training and best practices, partnering with community colleges and others with FAFSA completion, allowing us to scale our efforts and ultimately reach more Mississippi students and adults. In many ways, we've been victims of our own success. Earlier this year, we moved to a larger office space in Jackson, not because of the size of our staff increased, but because the demand of our services have increased so much that our prior space could no longer accommodate our programs and trainings. As David pointed out, Polly's book reminds us that there's nothing much new under the sun when it comes to facing adversity. For instance, we learned that Jack and Herman didn't waver in 1987 when the Black Monday crash brought the largest single decline in stock market history. Nor did they panic in 2000 when the dot-com bubble burst or when the housing bubble burst in 2008 and set off the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. Our founders' resilience has been a touchstone for me and our board during the five years that I've served as the foundation's president and CEO. And in 2020, our own times call us to adapt in ways that we couldn't foresee even 10 months ago. Now, that doesn't mean, however, that we sit around asking what Jack and Herman would do if faced by an existential crisis such as a pandemic. However, our history does tell us how they would have responded. They would have assessed the situation, developed a sound plan based on the best facts available, and then deployed the best people they had to take action, which is precisely the roadmap that we followed in our response to COVID-19. One of my favorite maxims about philanthropy is that philanthropy can make unimaginable happen faster. We can do that here because we're not a government agency. We're not bound by legislative decree or by the top-down structure of a statewide bureaucracy. As a mid-sized foundation, we can remain nimble and should be able to respond to a crisis in days instead of weeks or months. One way we've made the unimaginable happen faster is by providing funds to help students with their immediate needs. I've long said that many Mississippi students are just one flat tire away or one sick family member away from missing class and then losing an entire semester. 
and the return rates for low-income students who stop out or drop out of college for financial reasons are pretty discouraging. In response to COVID-19, the foundation has made $20,000 grants to each of Mississippi's 15 community colleges across the state. These grants provide small emergency payments, some as low as $75, to help students cope with everyday crises. Now, that may not seem like much, but if you're earning minimum wage, or if you're a single parent going to school and working part-time, an extra $75 can be a godsend. They can keep your internet turned on. You can put gas in your car so you can drive to a place where internet access is available for school, and enough groceries in the house to survive another week. But most importantly, a small emergency payment can keep you on track for one thing that can change your financial future, a college degree or credential. These examples remind us that while we may be all in the same storm, we're not in the same boat. As David mentioned, the usual ways that our Get to College counselors meet with students have been rendered impossible by COVID-19. But thanks to a highly creative and innovative staff and the use of technology in ways we had never attempted, during the 2019-2020 school year, I can proudly share with you that Mississippi still ranked fifth nationally in our number of FAFSA completions, which is down only slightly from our third place national ranking last year. At the same time, we've also been learning that the impact of COVID-19 goes deeper than many of us may realize. We recently met with a small group of high school seniors from Gulfport High School. I realize that these students are better off financially than many of the students we serve, yet to hear them describe how COVID-19 has turned their lives upside down was truly so some say that they are scared every time that they leave the house. They're deathly afraid of bringing home a virus that will kill an adverse family member. That's not something that most of us had to think about when we were in high school. And to compound matters, the students told us that their online learning was watered down and substandard. On top of that, we know that 39% of all Mississippi households lack access to broadband internet. So online learning isn't even an option for many students. Other students who expected athletic scholarships as a means to go to college have had their hopes dashed by canceled games, canceled visits to college campuses. Time and again, these young people have told us they're uncertain about their future and uncertain about college most of all. I meant to mention this not to be pessimistic, but realistic about the setbacks we face as we recover from the pandemic. The foundation will continue to find a way to reach and help such students. That's just what we do and who we are. And as always, we will promote college access and college success at the strategic and practical level. Again, our organization has always been able to do both at once. I mean, think back to when David, Jack, and Herman were building the Mississippi Higher Education Assistance Corporation. It was a complex, one-of-a-kind financial institution for Mississippi. It was heady stuff with frequent trips to meet with brokerage houses in New York City. And all the while, Jack was running the financial aid office at Millsaps College. The Wall Street bond markets didn't matter there, but helping poor and low-income students scrape together enough cash for books, tuition, and room and board certainly did. I like to describe ourselves as a philanthropy with muddy boots. So even as we work on the ground, we engage with private and public sector leaders at all levels to make college access and completion a top priority. And make no mistake, to safeguard the economic future of Mississippi, we truly have no other choice. The Georgetown Center on Education and the Workforce predicts that by 2027, 70% of all jobs will require a post-secondary degree or credential. Following the last recession, 99% of all new jobs that were created required a credential beyond high school. In the global economy, employees will either relocate or won't come here in the first place. Yet they can't find enough qualified workers. We've seen that happen too many times already. The good news is, is that Mississippi has made steady progress. In 2008, only about 29% of working age adults had a credential beyond high school. Today, 45% of working age adults in Mississippi do. Even so, we still lag well behind the U.S. average of 51%. So how do we close the education attainment gap? Well, I've always been a firm believer that only that which gets measured gets accomplished. For this reason, the foundation has strongly promoted the establishment of Mississippi's first post-secondary attainment goal. Philanthropy isn't just about making grants. It's about creating big ideas. As we pursue this goal, 
we will increase the number of working age adults who have some form of meaningful education or training beyond high school. It could be a bachelor's degree, an associate's degree, it might be a certificate in welding or HVAC or as a diesel mechanic, whatever it takes to gain the skills and knowledge that the 21st century workforce demands. Well, I'm pleased to share with you that just this past Wednesday, an attainment goal was approved by the Education Achievement Council, which is made up of legislators, education leaders, community college and university representatives, and representatives from business and industry. Now, there's a lot of whereas language in this document, so let me just cut to the chase. By 2030, the goal states that 55% of working age adults in Mississippi will have a degree or high quality credential. By 2035, 60% of working age adults will have a degree or high quality credential. Now keep in mind that only 45% of our working age adults fit that criteria today. And let me point out that this resolution that was approved is also committed to equitable post-secondary outcomes and seeks to close educational equity gaps where race is no longer a predictor of educational outcomes. Now this won't be easy, but at least we have a North Star that we can all follow together with a better educated citizenry, we will attract new economy jobs, we can break the cycle of poverty, and we will build a strong and secure middle class. Now looking ahead, we know this pandemic will run its course. And once it does, we also know that restoring our educational institutions must lie at the heart of Mississippi's economic recovery. Too many students have lost ground. Too many have lost hope in their future for us to do otherwise. Fortunately, guided by our attainment we already have a blueprint in hand for change. And as much as anything, this is where we'll write the next chapter in the Wilbur Hines Education Foundation history. As David said, when we envisioned our 25th anniversary in 2019, it didn't look anything like this. You know, we imagined plenty of hugs and handshakes and a good sit down Southern meal together, not Jim McHale talking to your computer screen. So, of course, we're eager to see all of this end. Even so, when it comes to the foundation and how we operate, I will not allow a return to the old normal. As Jack and Herman knew, good organizations grow and change in the face of adversity. During the pandemic, we learned so much about reaching students in no new ways that we'd be foolish to cast all of that aside. Instead, we will incorporate those valuable lessons into how we operate going forward and we'll be better off for it. In the past eight months, no one has climbed a deeper learning curve than the Wilbur Hines Education Foundation. We've had to grow and change in ways that my predecessors may never have expected. Yet to paraphrase Isaac Newton, if we have seen further than others, it's because we have stood on the shoulders of two giants, Jack Wilbur and Herman Hines. Thank you for listening. And now let me welcome someone who's really the star of this show, and she is Polly Demented the author of Defying Odds, Fulfilling Dreams. I can't imagine a more qualified person to write the Woodward Hines Education Foundation history than Polly. Polly is a Millsaps College graduate who grew up in Vicksburg, Mississippi. She's a well-traveled, accomplished writer with experience in public relations and marketing who has worked with leading national nonprofits and foundations here and in Washington, D.C. But most of all, Polly finds the beating heart of a good story in everyone she interviews and she turns their experience into lively writing that entertains even as it educates. Joining Polly is Sita Surinavasan. Sita is Director Emeritus of University Press of Mississippi. I was so thrilled when Sita agreed to serve as the project manager and editor for this book. Sita and Polly make a powerful team. So Polly, Sita, I gladly cede my computer camera to you. Thank you, Jim, for asking me to be a part of this celebration. One of the great rewards of being an editor is the associations I develop with authors. With the Polydement, my association is both professional and deeply personal. Every book is its own creature, and it's always interesting to see how ideas become reality in tangible form. In defying odds, fulfilling dreams, idea has multiple meanings. There's the idea of Jack Woodward, 
that led to the formation of Miak. <coughs> ideas underlying the various incarnations of Miak that ultimately resulted in the Woodward Hines Education Foundation. And then of course, there are the author's ideas of how to tell the story. Polly is an experienced author and was sure-footed on how to proceed. I served mostly as a signed, sounding board as the process unfolded. Polly began by gathering as much primary information as possible and interviewing as many stakeholders as she could possibly contact. She talked with Woodward Hines staff, poured over minutes of 40 years worth of meetings and anchored herself in institutional record and memory. She did research to understand the historical context in which MIAC and its iterations were created. Like scaffolding, most of this is not visible in the book, but all of it is what led to Polly's crystal clear rendering of a quite complex evolution of Jack Woodward's seemingly simple goal of we'll find a way to get students to college to a foundation that today funds educational initiatives and partnerships statewide. I always read with pencil in hand and Polly's manuscript was no exception. She's a gifted writer, so my challenge was to search for the occasional instances when I could edit her prose for clarity or elegance. And it was very satisfying to me when I merited a nicely done from the author. Sometimes, my very self-perceived smart editing met with a firm no. I had violated a legal or financial nuance. I left in awe of Polly's precise grasp and recall of arcane financial and legal details, even as she kept sight of the big picture. Polly, the perfectionist, was not satisfied with chasing down every detail and getting the narrative completely accurate. She also sought the most appropriate photographs that give life to the story. I never thought that a narrative focused on the intricacies of auction rate securities or buying and selling of student loans would make for exciting reading. In Polly's deft hands, it does. The history of the Woodward Hines Foundation is punctuated with twists and turns, some of which, some of which as David Martin mentioned, could have resulted in its demise, taking with it the dreams of its founders, the dreams of dedicated leaders who tread uncharted waters and pivoted to meet the moment. And most important, the dreams of generations of Mississippians who rely on it to realize their own aspirations for a brighter future. Smart and entrepreneurial people, however, ensured that the Woodward Hines Education Foundation would not only survive, but it would flourish. Polly kept these smart leaders always at the heart of the story. And the result is a narrative that makes for absorbing reading. In Defying Odds, Fulfilling Dreams, the Woodward Hines Education Foundation, 1980 to 2020, Polly mm -hmm. demanded us full gestures to an inspiring history. It was my privilege to work with her and to play a small part in its publication. Thank you. First, I need to fact check my editor. Sita Srinivasan hardly played a small part in creating Defying Odds, Fulfilling Dreams. Ours was a collaboration of the highest order built upon a friendship that grew out of a previous publishing enterprise. A quick aside on becoming a Mississippi writer. As Jim McHale said, I grew up in Vicksburg. In high school there, I was blessed to study with Vicksburg's legendary English teachers four in a row, Bourdon, Myers, Easley, and above all, Aarons. As a student at Millsaps, Dr. George Boyd, head of the English department, would call row at class every time we met. And we got to me, he would call out, Miss Polly DeMint, my favorite student, my least favorite writer. That was inspiration. Also at Millsaps, I was student assistant to Jack Woodward and a contemporary of David Martin. I love these Mississippi connections. And I thank Jim and David for giving me the opportunity to write about this amazing foundation. My charge was to translate a very complex 
organization history spanning 40 years into lay language for those who wonder how WHEF became the largest foundation based in Mississippi. In his introduction, Jim commented that I find the beating heart of a good story in everyone I interview. That's because the hearts of each and every one of the 30 plus people I interviewed for this book beat with passion for helping Mississippians create opportunities in their lives through post-secondary education. The story begins actually over 40 years ago with the dreams of two men to make it possible for more Mississippi students to pay for college. The first two chapters of the book focus on the life stories of Jack Woodward and Herman Hines, providing insight into their motivations for helping Mississippi students go to college. In chapter one, you'll learn that Jack grew up in what we call a Mississippi edition of an all-American family. He had a pretty regular boyhood playing football and shoveling coal into the boiler at the Woodward Hotel in Louisville. Jack and Nelda's daughter, Mary Woodward, observed, meeting lots of different people who stayed at the hotel opened up dad's mind to wider worlds. Growing up in a small rural town with the Citizens Council heavily in control, he probably recognized everything is not right. Woodward set a course for a life of service. In 1961, Mississippi's Methodist Bishop appointed the young minister director of religious life at Millsaps, where he was also handed the financial aid portfolio and eventually became dean of, dean of student financial aid planning. He felt like Millsaps was his pulpit, said his daughter Mary. He had a heart to serve and education was the way he saw to make people's lives better. But Woodward, while creative at finding a way for students to finance their educations was frustrated by barriers to financial aid. For one thing, banks were reluctant to make student loans. Why? Federal regulations were written so that if a student defaulted on a guaranteed bank loan, a single administrative error in servicing the loan could cause the bank to lose its guarantee, so they just couldn't make them. Chapter two tells the story of Herman Hines. The young Hines's father had lost his state appointed job raising chickens for the Mississippi State Insane Hospital when Governor Theodore G. Bilbo replaced him with a crony and he remained unemployed. Herman Hines was 15 years old at the outset of the Great Depression. His daughter, Linda Hines Broadus reflected, daddy was the boy who stayed in Jackson and worked different jobs to support his parents and sisters. Martha Heinz Botts added, he never had a chance to go to college. In 1936, Heinz began work as a clerk and part-time runner at Deposit Guarantee Bank and Trust Company. In 1974, 38 years later, the exceptional high school graduate was appointed chairman and CEO of Deposit Guarantee. While Heinz had a reputation with both family and coworkers as an intense, sharply focused taskmaster with a personality so strong that it would fill a room when he walked in, he had a big heart, according to Bud Robinson, his protege and later CEO, CEO of Deposit Guarantee. Julie Heinz Mabus reflected, Daddy was an institution builder. He probably headed every civic organization in Jackson. Sister Dorothea Sandra, former president of St. Dominic Health Services, on whose board Heinz served for 54 years, recalled that her friend and colleague, quote, could be lighthearted and that he loved music. In chapter two, you'll read the story of Sister D and Heinz singing a duet in harmony to Eudora Welty. The Woodward and Heinz stories merge in the 1970s. Hines joined the Millsaps College Board of Trustees in 1975. Around that time, Woodward had his eye on a new law authorizing the formation of nonprofits that could use tax exempt bonds to create a secondary market for student loans. That meant that banks could sell the student loans into the secondary market and use the proceeds to make more loans. 
when the president, then president of Millsaps College gave Woodward the green light to pursue formation of such a nonprofit, Woodward hesitated. I'll do it only if Herman Hines will help me, he said. Jack had the vision, Herman had the contacts and know-how in the financial world to make it a reality. David Martin is the young attorney, quote, out of whose typewriter MEAC came, as the story goes. The Mississippi Higher Education Assistance Corporation was chartered in January 1980. The storyline here winds through startups, reinventions, an international financial crisis, the Great Recession, brilliant moves and bad times, changing legislative statutes, including the end of the federally guaranteed student loan program and lots more. In reading Defying Odds, Fulfilling Dreams, you will discover that the story is one of constancy and change, both part and parcel of the way forward. The overarching constant is fidelity to the founder's vision, which would expand over time for the founders as well as for other MEAC and WHEF leaders. Helping students pay for college would always be a priority, but Woodward was determined in his push for the nonprofits to offer services to students and families that would help overcome the many other barriers to post-secondary education. Get to college, WHEF's flagship program led by Ann Hendrick embodies that expanded vision. Attracting the right leader at the right time is another remarkable concept in the history of MEAC and WHEF. Malcolm Lightsey, the first executive director, put MEAC systems in place, organized staffing, and made the secondary loan market operational. Ken Smith, beginning in 1990, was the right executive director to lead MEAC through steady growth in student loan purchases and the formation of Education Services Foundation, the precursor to WHEF, when competition threatened MEAC. When the Great Recession rolled over the US economy, leading to the 2008 crash of the auction rate securities market, the primary source of MEAC student loan financing, Sid Sims stepped up as executive director and Stan Pratt, who had worked with Sims at Deposit Guarantee, became board chair. Through innovative financial strategies, MEAC turned disaster into opportunity and improved its balance sheet considerably, creating funds for a healthy endowment for the philanthropic foundation that was not even yet on the horizon. The entrepreneurial Sims was undisputedly the right leader for those tumultuous times. A capacity for reinvention has been another constant for MEAC and WHEF. When the federal government decided in 2010 to become the direct lender for the federally guaranteed student loans, the need for secondary student loan market in Mississippi disappeared. No stranger to reinvention, the board went through a strategic planning process and decided in 2014 to become a philanthropic foundation. And the nonprofit's exceptional record of attracting the right leader at the right time remained constant. Jim McHale, an executive with W.K. Kellogg Foundation for over two decades, in 2015 became CEO of the Woodward Hines Education Foundation with a charge to develop capacities like grant making, which is well underway, to support its philanthropic mission and long-term vision. You will find these threads of constancy and change running throughout WHEF's remarkable history. Jack Woodward and Herman Hines have both departed the planet after long and meaningful lives. They defied odds to create the institutions that evolved into this philanthropic foundation. And as a result, more and more Mississippians are defying odds to get college educations. If Jack and Herman could parachute into Mississippi today, they would surely feel that their dreams continue to be fulfilled just as Mississippi students are creating opportunities through post-secondary education to fill their to fulfill their own dreams. Thank you. Thank you, Polly and Sita.
That was an excellent presentation. And if you ever record an audio version of Defying Odds, Fulfilling Dreams, I'm sure we'll be all ears to listen for it. We also can't wait to read whatever writing project you next embark on. Now, I'd like to introduce someone who we consider part of Woodward Hines' extended family. He is Dr. Rob Perigen, the 11th president of Millsaps College, a role that he has served in since 2010. Rob has extensive experience in higher education leadership and teaching. In Memphis native, Rob was a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of the University of the South in Sewanee, Tennessee, where he earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science. He went on to earn his master's and doctoral degrees in political science from Duke University. Rob's fields of academic interest include public law, political theory, and American government. As an instructor, Rob held teaching positions at Towering Oaks Academy in Memphis, at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, and at Hillsdale College in Michigan. Upon returning to the University of the South, Rob spent 23 years on the political science faculty there and held leadership positions of increasing responsibility, including vice president. But before Rob joins us, I'd like to announce a gift to show our appreciation for Millsap's role in Woodward Hines' history. Through a $100,000 grant, we have awarded an endowed scholarship at Millsap's College in honor of Jack Woodward and Herman Hines. We've talked today about Jack's role at Millsap's, but we haven't mentioned what a pillar of leadership Herman Hines was for the college. Herman served on the Millsaps Board of Trustees from 1974 until his death in 2010, a remarkable 36 years. It's no surprise that Herman once described Millsaps as, quote, one of the abiding loves of my life. The Wood Woodward Hines Scholarship Funds will provide financial aid for students who transfer from a community college to complete their bachelor's degrees at Millsaps. As I understand it, this is the first Millsap scholarship that targets students from this demographic. Now to tell us more about the college's role, I'd like to welcome Millsap's college president, Dr. Rob Perigen. Thank you, David. Uh, to you and to the board of the Woodward Hines Foundation and to Jim McMail, McHale, McHale, I'm sorry, for your leadership and for allowing Millsap's college to participate in this meaningful celebration. And on behalf of Millsaps, I offer congratulations to the Woodward Hines Education Foundation for 25 years of amazing work on behalf of students across Mississippi. The legacies of Jack Woodward and Herman Hines remain strong, and we are grateful for their support. And they're grateful for their impact. To Polly and Sita, it's always good to be with you in the same room or Zoom as the case may be. Your commitment to education and the general betterment of our state benefits us all. So thank you for all you do. We're proud at Millsaps to claim you both, Polly as a graduate of the class of 1967 and Setha as a 2013 honorary degree recipient. And to the members of the Woodward Hines and the Hines families who are here with us tonight, our deepest gratitude for you and for the memories we have of Jack and Herman their support of higher education and of Millsaps College in particular continues to echo on our campus and throughout our state. Their partnership stands strong and calls us to continue the work they began 25 years ago. To Nelda and the Woodward family, and to Julie and members of the Hines family, thank you. Jack's memory lives on every day on the Millsaps campus and flows through the work not only of our financial aid office, but through every corner of the campus that he made his home. We're still in his frequently repeated words, finding a way for our students. And Herman Hines' dedication as a trustee of Millsaps and his unrelenting determination as one of our state's leading businessmen set us on a path that is still clear and true today. 
Tonight's announcement of the establishment of an endowed scholarship at Millsaps in Jack's and Herman's name is important news for students who will come to us from the community college system. This is the first endowed scholarship at the college for this important group of student leaders. And it will open new opportunities for those who want to continue their studies at Millsaps, one of the premier liberal arts colleges and business schools in the nation. We're also excited about launching soon a new campaign among our alumni and friends of the college to match this foundation's grant. This new endowed support will strengthen efforts we've made in recent years to grant to target community college students seeking to continue their education at Millsaps. We partnered with Phi Theta Kappa to recruit students who have excelled in the classroom. And three years ago, we signed articulation agreements with each of the state's 15 community and junior colleges that align coursework and streamline the path to Millsaps. And now we have our first endowed scholarship exclusively, exclusively for these students. And it will open doors to bright futures for so many. It's also an acknowledgement of our past success in history with community college graduates, students. I, I think of individuals like the Reverend Dr. Joey Shelton back at Millsaps now as Dean of the Chapel and Director of Church Relations. Trustee Paul Benton, one of the most respected attorneys in the state and Dr. Bobby Robbins, former trustee, former CEO of the Texas Medical Center and current president of the University of Arizona. Each of these distinguished alums completed their undergraduate education at Millsaps following two years at a community college. And there are many success stories just like this. Speaking of successful Millsaps alums, I hope you won't mind me exercising the personal privilege of expressing gratitude to your board member and our dear friend, Andy Mullins. Andy served as a special assistant to three chancellors at Ole Miss, and he got paid for it. He serves as a special assistant and confidant to me without pay. I'm deeply grateful to Andy for his valuable service in so many ways, including as a board member of the Woodward Hines Education Foundation, and for being such a marvelous representative, representative of his alma mater and a dear friend. Thank you, Andy. It is on stories of Millsaps alumni like these and on this incredibly generous gift from the Woodward Hines Education Foundation that we will build at Millsaps a new generation of graduates who will live lives of learning, leadership, and service. Thank you for your partnership and your very generous support. Thank you, President Perrigan. And thanks to all who've joined us here today. It's been a great opportunity to celebrate the legacy of the Woodward Hines Education Foundation with you. But no, we're still a work in progress. There are still thousands of bright young people in Mississippi who need and deserve our help. In other words, the next 25 years starts today. So on behalf of the Woodward Hines Education Foundation board and staff, we'll be in touch. And until we meet again in person, I wish you all the best. <laughs>